I'd like to open the public hearing on House Bill 186. And welcome the sponsor, sponsor Representative Sullivan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Brian, Brian Sullivan. I'm chair of the Labor Committee and I represent uh, Sullivan County District 1. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce the, uh, the bill because, um, as you may know, the uh, Labor Committee actually received uh, three minimum wage bills, and um, we did somewhat of a combined hearing on all three bills. And after the uh, hearing, we um, took an assessment of the three bills and uh, found that HB 186 was the closest to what the, uh, uh, the committee was interested in, in um, pursuing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's sort of a combination of three. Um, and uh, I would say that HB uh, 186, as amended, um, is a pragmatic bill. Um, it uh, essentially takes uh, an, an approach of uh, doing three things in a minimum wage bill. Um, it, it has a progressive increase um, over the course of three years. Um, it goes from 950 to 1075 and to $12, and that's in uh, 2020, 21, and 22. Um, it also addresses uh, tipped wages in a modest manner. It changes the uh, tipped wage percentage uh, from 45% of the minimum wage to 50%, which is uh, where it was uh, back in the early 90s. Um, there was some shuffling that went on between the, the state minimum wage and the federal minimum wage. Um, that uh, resulted in the 45 percent, but uh, this simply returns um, the tip wage to 50 percent where it had been for quite some time <coughs> when the um, state had a minimum wage. Um, it also uh, uh, creates a youth minimum, wa minimum wage. Um, this is for uh, uh, youth that are under the age of 17 um, and um, essentially provides for a uh, minimum wage that's one dollar less than the prevailing minimum wage. Um, the, the thinking of the committee was that um, uh, for, for kids who are um, working uh, during the summer scooping ice cream or um, uh, we're working at uh, uh, one of the resorts or um, places that uh, our tourists uh, come, come to, <clears throat> so, um, allow those employers to have a slightly lower minimum wage uh, for those uh, young workers who probably aren't uh, maintaining a household or raising children or that type of thing. So um, it seemed to the committee that um, the youth wage would be um, helpful to some businesses. Um, it's our feeling, the committee's feeling, um, and my feeling that it is time for New Hampshire to again have a minimum wage. Um, it, uh, the federal minimum wage certainly is not leading us in a direction that's uh, helpful. Um, this uh, particular bill, um, in a modest way, moves uh, the minimum wage uh, from 7.25 an hour, where it is now, into the realm of what employers are actually paying. Um, there's lots of testimony that uh, said that employers typically are paying um, 10, 11, 12 dollars an hour. And, <clears throat> and this uh, simply moves the minimum wage in, into that area. Um, the uh, fiscal note indicates that there are a few um, uh, state employees who earn under $12 an hour, but quite uh, very few. And uh, the fiscal note also indicates that uh, over the course of the next three years, there will probably be um, fewer as they move uh, from starting wages um, on up. So um, again, um, we think this is a uh, pragmatic bill, a bill that uh, has an, a chance of uh, becoming law, and um, we ask you to support it. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Any questions? Did you hear testimony from folks in the Hospitality Association about the tip to minimum wage and concern um, about raising the percentage? Because one of the concerns, if I just Good. One of the concerns that I had heard, which is the reason that I crafted my version a bit differently, that. was that a number of restaurants um, have 
tipped employees who make significantly more, two to three times more. And by increasing the percentage of the minimum that they're paying, it means that the actual hourly minimum wager earners in that same facility would not be able to see increases above the minimum as quickly. Um, and I don't know if you heard anything to that effect, but. Um, we heard from those folks twice. Um, once uh, when we were hearing our House bill, um, or the House bills, I should say, and again when we were hearing the Senate bill. And um, I think the concern for TIP uh, uh, employees in particular is um, the very low minimum wage of 725 we have now. So basically, the threshold that they have to get to is, uh, is a very low threshold. Um, I did see a version that uh, immediately put it to twelve dollars an hour as a threshold, which I think would have an immediate impact on. Um, I mean, there are people who are working at high-end restaurants who are making, you know, very good money. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also people who are serving breakfast, who um, may, may be getting a tip of a buck fifty um, on a on a meal. Um, so, um, I think it would that aspect of it would definitely benefit those those folks. So. Uh, I saw value in the uh, immediate move to a twelve dollar minimum. Okay. Thank you. More questions? I just have a kind of a would you believe? My brother lives in Chatham, Massachusetts. He has two daughters, twenty one and eighteen, and they both scoop ice cream at the most expensive ice cream shop in Chatham, Massachusetts, and it's um, they pay seventeen dollars an hour for kids to start. It's incredible. Yeah. So Which one is it? I forget the name, I'll get it for you though. Uh, you won't go though, it's expensive. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Send them Thank you. 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 Thank uh, I was determined. I forewent, you know, skiing um, uh, on occasion, even to work some extra weekend hours, and uh, I was just determined to get my my first car when I was 16. Um, I probably didn't. I probably didn't need you know anything higher than what this bill would have allowed me. But my I guess my concern is that I had a friend. Um, Call her, um, call her Angela. Uh, she worked far more than I did, um, and a lot of her money went to support her little brother and their family. It was really struggling, and so my, I guess my concern is uh, undervaluing or potentially arbitrarily. Valuing the the work, the labor of someone who is 16 or 17 or 15 or 14, um, less than um, what a the minimum wage would be set at. Maybe if you could just walk me through the thinking on that. I mean, I, I, I kind of get it, but at the same time, obviously this probably came across your mind. I would just like to hear the rationale. It, we certainly have heard from folks who say that there are kids out there who are contributing to the family income uh, in meaningful ways. Um, the, the balance was that um, there are some businesses that uh, operate on a pretty um, low margin and depend on teenage labor, especially during the summer, especially in the tourist in industry. Um, they depend on those kids to get by. Um, I would say that the uh, the youth minimum wage is not the central piece of this um, this bill, um, nor is the tipped minimum wage um, as put together. The, the the real key is a progressive increase to the um, uh, minimum wage uh, in a direction that, uh, as I said earlier, would move move into the types of wages that are currently being paid, um, not as uh, lucrative as certain ice cream shops, um, <laughs> but uh, it's certainly something that I think the uh, would, would benefit uh, a lot of folks. Thank you. Any questions? Senator Wolf? Okay. Uh, 
that's an interesting comment. If if tip and youth don't mean as much, then I, I guess I fail to understand why minimum wage means anything. Because I, I I would hope that businesses came in and testified in the house because I'm hearing from those people every day. One this morning, and they're basically the businesses are stressed. They're paying much more than what you're saying here, from what I can see, and they just don't need any more rules set on them, from what I'm hearing. Where's business in your committee? We did hear from some business, um, and um, I think this, the, the sense is that, um, <clears throat> frankly, we heard from a lot of folks who wanted the, a minimum wage to go to $15 an hour. Um, in fact, there was a uh, floor amendment <coughs> that uh, in the House to move the minimum wage fully to $15 an hour. Um, and there we heard from a lot of, a lot of young people who uh, feel very uh, adamantly that we need to move towards, uh, I don't think $12 is a living wage, I don't think $15 is a living wage, but there are people who are trying to survive on those types of uh, minimum wages and we think this is a good balance between the needs of business and the needs of uh, workers. Well, yeah, I, I ju just saw that we can debate the point. The point isn't what the number is, because that'll become a debate of whether a business stays in business or doesn't. Um, the, the point is setting a rule on any industry. You, you basically said it doesn't matter with tipped and it doesn't, you didn't say it doesn't matter, you said you're less concerned about tip and you, but it's the setting of the rule on any business. They, was there any talk in the House that the businesses are basically concerned that New Hampshire is getting involved in, in what's working? Um, I think there may have been some discussion along those lines, um, but um, I think the, uh, in the end, um, the balance was that yes, the rule is, is a value, and uh, it is needed to move certain employees into a, uh, a survivable situation. No, thank you. Representative Monty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you again, uh, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Howard Moffat. I represent Merrimack District 9, which is Loudoun and Canterbury. And I'm here to speak uh, in support of HB 186. I happen to have been the prime sponsor of the original 186, which you've heard was one of three bills that was considered and then integrated in some way by the Labor Committee in the House. Um, I'm here to say that I'm very comfortable with where the House Labor Committee ended up in merging those three bills. I would also like to add that I would be very comfortable with Senator Susi's bill. We don't see this as uh, <coughs> competing with Senator Susi's bill. We think they're complementary, uh, and I'm very comfortable leaving it to the members of this committee to make judgments about what to pick from each or which one to go with. Um, I've given you written testimony. I'm not going to read it line by line. Uh, I do want to speak briefly to the major points that uh, I've tried to make here. Um, one is that uh, although there's argument about this, my strong view is that raising the minimum wage would create more jobs over the medium term, not less. Two, it would increase consumer demand, boost sales, and strengthen the state's economy through the multiplier effect, and I'll say more about that in a minute. Three, it would reduce welfare payments directly and taxes indirectly. And four, 
And I don't know how to summarize this except to lay it out, all right? Um, I, I come from a Republican-leaning district. And one of the issues that I ran on was the increasing gap that we have in our society between the very rich and the very poor. So to me, there's a very basic fairness issue tied up in this. And I know that not everybody sees it that way, but to me, that's important. So first, jobs. You're going to hear from other witnesses that, this, that a bill like this is going to cost jobs. And yes, it will cost some jobs in the short term. I don't think there's any question about that. But over the medium term, it's going to create more jobs. There are a lot of studies that show that. There are studies on both sides of this issue. Most of the studies that, that suggest that the major effect of raising the minimum wage is to cut jobs, to reduce jobs, come from corporate interests like the Chamber of Commerce, ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, um, the Heritage Foundation, others like that. There are many studies on the other side which suggest that properly implemented, raising the minimum wage over time creates more jobs, not less. I, don't, I just want to cite one which I found really interesting, and it's got a very nerdy title. I mentioned it at the bottom of page one. It's, it's called the minimum wage effects across state borders, colon, evidence from contiguous counties. And it was a study that, a, a longitudinal study that looked at adjoining counties in adjoining states. The first states had passed a minimum wage law that was obviously operative in those counties. The second, the second states, the, the other states, had not passed a minimum wage law. And it happens that two of the counties that were involved in the study were Cheshire County in New Hampshire and Wyndham County across the Connecticut River in Vermont. Vermont had raised its minimum wage, New Hampshire had not. And what the study, what the study found over time is that um, Incomes of low-income workers were not affected in the restaurant and retail industries, the hospitality industry and the, and the low-wage sales jobs in the big box stores. But it had no, raising the minimum wage had no detectable effect on incomes generally in the state and on, on, on jobs. Um, so so you, you clearly have a situation where there would be some detrimental impact on a few low-wage workers. We don't have that many in New Hampshire that are actually making the minimum wage. The best estimates I've seen are around 10,000. But over time, it creates more jobs. And it does that through what economists call the multiplier effect. Consumer spending on, on everything from fast food to childcare to cars and everything in between accounts for 70% of the American economy. When consumers are strapped for cash and low wage workers always are strapped for cash, they just don't buy things. They don't buy stuff. They don't buy services. They don't have the money to do that. The result is that over time, not as many goods and services are sold as would be sold if consumers had more money to spend. So when you raise the minimum wage, you're putting money into the economy and it goes through several cycles. And that's what economists call the multiplier effect. And over time, what you see is that um, Everybody has more money to spend, so consumers buy more goods and services, and companies hire more workers to meet the increased demand, and they spend more money. 
and, and the cycle goes, goes through itself again. Um, you know, Henry Ford had, a, had an intuitive understanding of that virtuous cycle. He, he knew, he understood that his company was going to do better if he paid his workers enough that they could buy the cars coming off his assembly line. It just makes, makes common sense and it makes economic sense. I want to talk for a minute about welfare costs and taxes. Um, as Representative Sullivan said, nobody in the United States can reasonably be expected to live on $12 an hour. I would, I would suggest to you that nobody should reasonably be expected to live on $15 an hour earlier. But we set the stakes in this bill in a modest way, as Chairman Sullivan <coughs> mentioned. Um, and I want to just call your attention briefly to a study that was done by former representative, former Republican state rep, Doug Hall, and it's, it's summarized in the attachment to your written testimony. And I want to say something at the minute, at, at the moment about this, okay? I strongly suspect, I'm a former newspaper guy and I know how newspapers work, I strongly suspect that Doug Hall was not responsible for the headline in this article. It's a little hyperbolic, okay? So look beyond the headline. I urge you to read the article. What it demonstrates is that a typical single mom with two kids in the Concord area in 2014 who was making $10.25, three dollars more than our current minimum wage, had to rely on five, yes, five government welfare programs to make ends meet for herself and her kids. In the meantime, some of our biggest corporations, like Walmart and McDonald's, are basically coaching their employees on how to apply for government welfare programs, state and federal government welfare programs, because they're not paying them enough to live on. So I, I call your attention to the article. I hope you'll look at it uh, and get past the headline. <coughs> Finally, the fairness issue. Um, I think of myself as a moderate guy. I'm not on the progressive edge of my party. Um, but I am increasingly concerned about the growing disparity in our country between the very rich and the very poor. I don't see pitchforks in the street. I don't pretend that I expect to see pitchforks in the street. But I do believe that this problem of the disparity in wealth and income between rich and poor, the very rich and the very poor, is contributing heavily to the sense we have that the country is off track and that a lot of people just don't feel that they can make it anymore in this country. Um, to me, that is a problem. This bill is not the panacea to it, but it's one of the few things that we can do that would address that issue. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll shut up unless the committee Thank has you. questions. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Representative. As you know, our districts yes. overlap. Yes. Mine's a little larger. Given. Granted. But when I'm out in my district, I'm talking to a lot of the guys who own C stores that aren't Walmart, they aren't McDonald's, they aren't large corporations that are paying their employees $10 an hour, $11 an hour, that are afraid if this were to pass, they'd be forced to pay $13 and $14 an hour. 
because they're paying over minimum wage to retain these workers, and they're telling me there's no way they can afford it. So my question is, have you been out talking to these small businesses, not these large corporations that you speak of, but the small businesses within your district to see how they feel about this? Yes, Senator French, I have. Um, I, I talked to the owner of the Canterbury Country Store, which is exactly what you're talking about. He pays his, his workers $10 an hour. He said, I got no problem with this bill because I'm, I'm there anyway. He's at $10 now. The minimum wage now, today, if this bill is passed, would be $7.25. It would go up to $9.50 an hour in January of next year. He's still, he's still paying him more than that. It would push him up to $10.75 on January 1, 2021. But it's not going to—it's it's not going to have a a negative effect on his his ability to, to stay in business. He's having trouble staying in business because of other factors. Country stores are in trouble in this country. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Representative Cahill, support the student. Thank you. Sir. My name is uh, Michael Cahill. I represent the 17th District of Rockingham County, the towns of Newfields and Newmarket. And I'd like to you know, really echo the testimony of my chairman, uh, Representative Sullivan, and the prime sponsor, Mr. Moffitt, that these are, this is an important bill. It's a gradual bill. Uh, we're listening here in New Hampshire to New Hampshire businesses, not to the federal government that says it should be this way, but to our own economy to determine what a real uh, wage should be for a minimum wage. And I, I do think that the, the, uh, that the youth wage is important. I, we list, uh, this is my fourth term in the House, so that's longer than some and shorter than others. Uh, but I've been on the Labor Committee and I've heard from people with the ice cream shops, and, et cetera, that said that you know, a young person, really their first job, maybe doesn't know how to work. They have to learn you know, some of the soft skills, some of the, you know, some of the other things. And as this was pointed out, they're generally not supporting the family, but they may be contributing. And, and that's all good. And if they can be hired uh, at a dollar less, it's optional. The employer could pay them more if he's impressed with their working ability. He could, this is only an optional dollar less. I think that could lead to more employment of these young people who want to get those first jobs. So I think that's an important thing, and I think it would appeal to the business. It, it's, it was a positive thing for the business that we heard from. Uh, the, the tipped wages, uh, I understand that you know, the hospital, restaurant prices go up 3% a year. You know, it helps them and it helps them. Hit, but the, the threshold they have to reach is, is pretty small. And there seems to be a problem in the industry of you know, not, paying, not paying wages. They often get a, a check for zero. And if the business is doing well, the restaurant's doing well, the server's doing well, that's no problem. But they, they're really surviving on the tips. Uh, this bill doesn't hurt that. It does just give them a little bit more, a little bit more money in the event that it's a slow day, and they're, they're not, you know, they're there for the full shift, and they need to get some money so they can pay their bills. So I hope that you'll uh, look favorably on this bill. It's it's a gradual bill, something that's right for New Hampshire, and uh, right for we need to have people able to work. With the employers are having trouble getting people. And I think this makes it a lot more competitive with our neighboring states. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Representative Hughes, support and not speaking. Representative Spann, support and speaking. Good afternoon. Is it? Uh, no, it's still morning. It's still morning. Um, yeah, I come at to this from two perspectives. One is that I did extensive work in, um, in low-income housing when I was working in New York and getting my planning degree. But I also um, then went on to get an MBA and began to study about um, the broader economics of the state. I'm coming at this from a very different point of view. Um, I'm 
looking at the impact of these low income uh, jobs on our families. This should not be a partisan issue. It should be an issue that relates to the, all of the problems that are happening in our state. And I'm going to mention two of them. Uh, one of the big elements in whether somebody, uh, a student succeeds or not in, in school has to do with the participation of their parents. We can throw all the money in the world at our schools, but it won't make any difference if there aren't parents there at home with the, to make sure that their kids are making the most of their education. The second one is the opiate crisis. What a difference it would make if kids are not supervised, if they're not even having dinner with their parents to learn about um, the healthy family and social values. If you have a family where both parents are working two jobs, those parents are not there for their kids. Um, it's as simple as that. We are shooting ourselves in the foot if we are not providing an income for these families where the parents can be there and lead to a healthy family life with good values and appropriate discipline for their kids. So I urge you to think about the bigger picture, um, what a low income means, not only in terms of whether Johnny can get his iPad, but in terms of whether Johnny is getting a good education or whether Johnny is spending his time out on the street shooting up. Um, and I think that that is an, a bipartisan family values way of looking at this that we should not lose sight of. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Mara Willen, support not speaking. <coughs> Rob Free, support not speaking. Pat Wozowski, support not speaking. Lizanne Platt, support not speaking. Louise Spencer, support not speaking. I can't read this first name, I think the last one is Christian. Support, and it doesn't indicate speaking. <coughs> Suzanne Covert, support and not speaking. Nang Brennan, where, support and not speaking. Bill Alleman, oppose and not speaking. Alvin C, oppose and not speaking. Dennis Jakubowski, support and doesn't indicate speaking or not. Sarah Smith, support and speaking. Honorable Senators, uh, thank you for uh, letting me uh, speak today. My name is Sarah Smith. I live in, in Pembroke, New Hampshire. Um, I have an all too common tale to tell. Uh, it's a tale of two times today and 40 years ago. I'm a retired teacher um, and I tutor, uh, volunteer tutoring, a recent American immigrant in reading and English. Um, she works at a big retailer in Concord, one of the ones we've been talking about, uh, putting things on shelves and helping customers. Forty years ago, I too worked at a similar job, work, uh, putting things on shelves, helping customers. Um, she makes slightly more than minimum wage, bringing home about $400 a week. I work for slightly more than minimum wage. Both of us work full time. 40 hours. On that minimum wage, I paid my rent, I bought food, and lived totally independently. My employer supplied full health insurance. She does have two children, teenage boys, hungry teenage boys, but she qualifies for food stamps, rental assistance, and Medicaid for health care. In other words, 
she's considered to be living in poverty. This is not a living wage. And though I'm there to help her learn to read, I've ended up reading and helping her with uh, the letters and forms that she gets, so I've started to see a little bit more of what goes on in her life. Um, and uh, I, so I see the effects of these different, different paperwork on someone in this position. Um, and so even with all this financial assistance, there, there are other financial problems that come up, things that happen that are clearly beyond her ability to handle on the amount of money that she makes. Um, and so I, I, it clearly, it shows that it's, it's hard to live on this wage. And although I support raising the minimum, this bill may not help her until it goes to 12 or 15. This still leaves her per hour. She still leaves, leaves her on full assistance from the state. And to me, that's, that's, we're saying that it's okay. It's okay for people to need to have that kind of financial assistance and work full time. Uh, uh, to me, that's, that's not acceptable. And why is it that, why is it that 40 years ago I was able to live on a minimum wage and she can't? It just shows that the minimum wage has not kept up with, with the living costs that we have today. Um, and uh, so I, I would support raising this wage. I don't think the, the amount it's being raised is enough, um, but uh, in, it, enough for her to live on uh, or anyone in her situation. <coughs> These are real people in our state who are living in this situation today. Uh, she's not a teenager, she's a mother, she has two teenage kids, and this is what she has to live on. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Faith Stillers, support, doesn't indicate wanting to speak. Mary Ellen Foley, support, not speaking. Kathy Staub, support, and speaking. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to um, offer my thoughts on HB 186 to raise the minimum wage. Um, for the past year or so, I've been part of the Raise the Wage Coalition, um, which is part of the Raise Up New Hampshire, and we're a group of faith-based and labor and community organizations um, that have been advocating uh, for raising the minimum wage because many of the people who would benefit for this can't be here today. So we have to be here um, in, their, um, in their stead. Um, and um, let me just begin by saying that I've provided you with some information that I got from the ELMI, um, the New Hampshire Department of Labor. So those are numbers from a year ago. Um, so uh, one can imagine that the wages that are for those low-wage jobs um, have increased in the past year and will continue to increase before this uh, uh, bill goes into effect. Um, New Hampshire is the only state in New England that does not set its own minimum wage. Minimum wages in every other state in, in New England are yeah, at least $3 higher. Um, Maine is a good example of what happens when one raises the minimum wage. I have not seen their economy collapse. They did this by referendum. They raised it first to nine and then to 10, and then it's now at 11, and it will be going to 12 next year. So, um, you know, they're, uh, un they posted the lowest unemployment that they've had in 40 years, and when I go home, I'm going to email this testimony with some links to some of the other studies that um, show what has actually happened in the state of Maine when they um, raised their minimum wage from 9.50 to where it is now at 11. Um, because the cost of living varies widely from state to state, I think it's really important for a state to set its own minimum wage. 
Um, costs of living is very high in New England. I think New Hampshire has the 11th highest cost of living. Arkansas has the third lowest cost of living and their minimum wage is now 925. So um, I think they're, um, that it is vitally important that we set, set the minimum wage locally because um, it affects the people that live here in the state. Um, and it's essential for preserving the quality of life for the residents. Um, the average uh, wage, uh, starting wage in New Hampshire now is 11.32, um, and that you know covers a lot. The lowest uh, starting wage that I could find was you know fast food at 8.43 an, an hour. So, um, but again, you know those things vary from place to place in the state, and I think that was a year ago. So. Um, given that we still have such a low unemployment rate and people are having struggling finding people to work, um, uh, I think that probably is higher now. I think everyone in this room would agree that in the state of New Hampshire or really anywhere in the United States, 7.25 an hour is a starvation wage, um, and it's true that most employers are paying more. But you know there are people that make 8.25, 8.50 an hour. One of the things that we did with um, the raise up. Um, New Hampshire Coalition was we did uh, visibilities and people would walk by and young men in particular would tell us they were making 825 or 850 an hour. Um, these are our young men who, um, you know, we used to call people like them the backbone of society when, when my parents were, you know, working in the mills. Uh, they were unskilled workers. Uh, yeah, they could be working construction jobs if we were going to start um, fixing our bridges and and uh, retrofitting houses to make them more energy efficient. But right now they're working in service industries, you know, they're working at the dollar store, they're working, uh, you know, uh, in food prep, they're um, um, doing other low wage jobs. Um, and so I, I just, you know, we, we talk about high tech and everything, but you know, not everybody is cut out to sit in front of a computer all day and write code. And we can't just kick those people to the curb. I mean, the person who gave you your coffee this morning probably did more for U.S. productivity than most CEOs will do in their entire career. I mean, just because, you know, I mean, where would we be without the person at Dunkin' Donuts who's at the drive-out window handing out coffee? I mean, and that person has value in society, and I think we need, um, we need to recognize that. The other thing is that um, this is a systemic problem. Um, the average wage in New Hampshire is uh, $25.17 an hour, and that was a year ago. But the, um, the median age is $19.17 an hour, which means that half of the people in the state are making less than that per hour. The average housing wage for a, a two-bedroom apartment um, in the state is $22.32 an hour. So that means that more than half of the working people in this state cannot afford an apartment. So I think, and that is something that we could um, address systemically with policy, like raising the minimum wage. So I, I have no, um, I think that, that this, is, this is a good bill, doing it gradually so that small businesses can um, absorb the cost as it goes forward. Um, and you know the, the person at the Canterbury store might have more people coming to them to get a cup of coffee or buying uh, some donuts or um, even a package of Doritos um, because they can afford to do that now because uh, the dollar store now has to pay them a wage that's comparable to what the owner of the Canterbury store is paying his workers. So. Um, I, I, the only criticism that I would have is that I, I think that 9.50 to start is a little bit too low, and I would like to see $10 an hour um, for that that first year. Um, the other thing, you know, the, we we talked a little bit about the youth wage, and um, also I just recently saw that um, New Hampshire has the highest college debt in the country. So those young people who are getting those first jobs, if they were being paid more, they could save more money. You know, if they got, uh, if they made an extra $750 a year, that would pay for uh, a credit at the community college. So, I mean, I really do think that, that this, the time has come. It's been over 10 years since we've raised the minimum wage in New Hampshire, and I think uh, our people deserve it, and the time has come. And I'm happy to answer any questions. I've done a lot of research on this, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Any questions?
Okay, well, did you keep, what was the average wage in the May of um, uh, 2018 was twenty-five dollars and seventeen cents an hour. There's a lot more daylight between twenty-five and seven twenty-five than there is between twenty-five and sixty, seventy, eighty dollars <laughs> an hour, which some very wealthy people make. Um, but the median age is nineteen dollars and seventeen cents. So that means there are a lot of people that are making less than um, $25 an hour. Thank you. Thank you. Viola Catrucini, support for speaking. opportunity to be here. My name is Viola Patsini for the record and I live in Manchester. Um, I have this five before the committee here and also in the house. But I just have a few things to share. Um, the, the notion that most people that are getting uh, low wages or working uh, getting low wages than most the teenagers uh, for instance is not really true because all we know is that a majority of uh, low wage workers are actually not teenagers. Uh, they're actually adults. But also uh, the fact that uh, when I hear the notion that uh, teenagers are working and uh, so they should be paid uh, better a fair wage uh, is not true because I know, for instance, families that I've worked with where you find youth are working to help support the family. Um, I know a, a lady right now, she's an adult herself, she has a family of her own. But a few years ago, she was working uh, with, with her mother working in the household with her sister working and she was helping her little brother buy uh, sports gear and buy books and buy everything that they needed in the house. So she was contributing uh, to the household income. Uh, so this notion that most of the teenagers that are working are just getting extra money to buy a new pair of sneakers and a new iPhone is not really true. Um, the second piece that uh, with the, the current legislation um, that, I'm, that really bothers me or worries me is the fact that we are trying to continue to create this separate wage flow for tip workers as well as uh, regular workers. And we know that research has shown from the Economic Policy Institute that uh, the practice of tipping often discriminates against uh, white and black and brown workers, service workers. So you tend to find that white workers get tipped more than uh, black and brown workers when they're doing the same service. Uh, so I think we should be putting into consideration that all work is valued, so regardless if it's tipped or not tipped, that uh, this notion of separating the two wages actually perpetuates the racial and gender inequalities that we kind of see in our community. Um, and then uh, I've been to so many, so many of the hearings here recently about wages, and one of the testimonies from the uh, restaurant association or restaurant owner was talking about how his restaurant workers get so much tips at the end of the day. But that's really, um, that's not really the norm. That's an exception. So even in a high-end industry, a high-end restaurant, for instance, I have a, a co-worker who used to work in a restaurant industry. And uh, she'll tell you that it depends on the day, it depends on the, um, on the people that she serves, it depends on so many factors. And you shouldn't have to put workers in a, in a situation where they have to rely on tips to be able to um, support their families. That's not fair. So that's all I have to say for today. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, thank you. JJ Smith, support and non-speaker. Isaac Grimm, support and non-speaker. Alessandra Murray, support and speaker. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Alessandra Murray and I live in Manchester's Ward 11. Um, I'm a member of Rights and Democracy in New Hampshire. I'm here to testify in favor of HB 186. I'm nearly 25 years old and up until last year I did not make a living wage at either of my jobs. Like thousands of other working people in New Hampshire, I have had to work long hours and multiple jobs to make ends meet. At some points in the past two years, I'd be scheduled to work up to 70 hours a week between my jobs as a barista and at a library. And often I would end up working extra shifts on top of these hours because that would make the difference between me being able to make rent or eat or pay electricity that month. 
I still work two jobs now, and on top of that, I'm a full-time student, and I strive to make room in my busy schedule to volunteer with my church and grassroots organizations because I want to stay involved in my community. My working life started when I was 18, and almost immediately I jumped into full-time employment. I was getting paid $9 an hour to manage a retail position um, while living at home in an unhealthy family environment. I couldn't manage to save enough to move out, and I couldn't get approved for any apartments I could afford because my monthly income was so low. Landlords you typically look for you to be making three times the amount of rent, and even if I knew that I could make ends meet and um, afford an apartment, they would never give me um, the chance. Um, so I was forced to stay in an unsafe situation through my early 20s, unable to move out, and unable to pursue a higher education because I could not afford to. Um, I know my story is not uncommon. Um, I'm here today not just for myself as a young worker who desperately needs higher wages, but also for the young and middle-aged and older working class people in this state. Contrary to popular belief, the average age of workers making at or near minimum wage is mid-30s, and all these hardworking adults should be paid enough to sustain their livelihoods. Given that New Hampshire is the ninth most expensive state to live in the United States, it's frankly irresponsible and immoral that our minimum wage is the lowest in New England. Um, we talk about wanting the youth to stay in our state, but we're not giving them the opportunity to afford to stay here between student debt and not being able to make enough at their jobs. This is the richest country in the world, and anyone working full-time should be able to afford the basics, period. No one should ever have to choose to stay in a bad situation like I had to because their job doesn't pay them enough to get out. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Melissa uh, Einbaum, support and not speaking. Bruce Berkey, opposed and speaking. Um, he said if here, so. Bruce had to leave, but. Uh, the client, let's see, there's NFIB, he has a uh, New Hampshire, New Hampshire right. convenience stores, a host. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin Flynn, the foes are not speaking. Alejandro Urundia? Urundia, yes. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. I am going to speak on favor of, the, of this bill, and I want to be. I was uh, planning to talk about the quality of life of, of the families and the absence of the parents because they are not going to be able to, to spend time with their children at uh, meals. Also, they are not able to spend leisure time with their children because they need to go to work. I know families that they work three or four, or, or even four jobs. Um, I want to talk about, um, as you probably noticed already because my kind of foreign accent, this southern accent is from Mexico. So. Is, uh, is I've been living here for 30 years, and I work with a lot of immigrant families. So uh, because of the fact that I speak Spanish, I speak a little bit of Portuguese. And, um, and I have been going with some of them to, because when someone is, is resident uh, for many years in the United States, for more than 15 years, and is older than 50 years old, they can have the interview in their own language. So I go there and there is something that amused me. How is it possible that someone that is living for so many years in the United States is not able to have enough, enough English to be able to go to the interview? And then I ask, what happened? Well, I have been need to work. I have been working, I was not opportunity to be able to study English. Even has been working with other people speaking the same language. There is not only is the fact that these, uh, these, uh, these uh, people, they need to do many jobs to be able to, to help their families. But also, um, uh, and, um, and the lack of quality of their families is the lack of opportunities to study. There is how many people are here they need to work to feed their families, to pay their rents. By the way, how many people live in rents, uh, very, uh, with uh, low rents, we can say, in a house that they are not really in good condition? And they are not healthy environment because they cannot afford it. Uh, probably we can increase the minimum wage, they could afford uh, better, better places to live, and that can help to the other places to work better and to have a, a, a good 
a good quality environment to have the family, so we're more competition on, 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 the, on the houses available. But beside that is many people, they could be able to get better wages if they were able to study, beginning to study English. How you are going to study English if you don't have time? How you are going to study uh, to become a technician or something if you don't have the money and the time to do because you need to work so many hours? So for me, I, I really believe if we increase the, 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 mini, the, uh, the minimal wage, that is going to help the families that they need the most. That is going to have some, some impact on the business? Yes. But the difference is the, the, the business, they can adapt if the business, they can survive. Most of them, and they can adapt. They don't want to tell me they cannot adapt to that increase of salary. The impact on the families that are more affected is going to be very positive and very good for the quality of life and for the economy of the state. Thank you. I thank don't know you. if you have any questions. Any questions? Sinan, thank you. Thank you. David Holt, support, and Governor of the Cape of speaking. Molly Grover, support, not speaking. Arnie Albert, support, and speaking. Thank you, Senator Kavanaugh, and members of the committee. My name is Arnie Alpert. I'm the co-director for the New Hampshire program of the American Friends Service Committee. I'm also a resident of Canterbury, and that means that Senator French is my senator, and Representative Moffitt is my representative. Uh, I appeared before you uh, back in March uh, at the hearing on Senate Bill 10, which, as you know, is very similar to this, so I'm not going to repeat most of what I said at that time. I gave you uh, fact sheets that compared the uh, minimum wage in New Hampshire or the lack of minimum wage in New Hampshire to those of the surrounding states and also gave you information about typical rental costs in New Hampshire based on the New Hampshire Housing Annual uh, Rental Survey, which shows that even at $15 an hour, uh, typical apartments in New Hampshire are not affordable for, for people working at the lower end of the wage scale. So uh, that's a, that's a clearly is a, is a problem that Mr. Arutia also just made reference to a moment ago. The one thing that's changed since, uh, since I was here in March that I'm aware of is next door in Vermont, where uh, a bill there, which is called S23, is making its way through the Vermont legislature. Currently, the minimum wage in Vermont is $10.77 an hour. Uh, and under current law, it's scheduled to be increased starting next year with the cost of living according to the Consumer Price Index. What S23 would do is raise the wage in one, two, three, four, five more steps, basically every year, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2024, to bring it up to $15 an hour in 2024. Uh, that bill has passed the Senate. Uh, it's been through uh, one committee in the House, uh, which actually made an adjustment to it, their concern had to do with what's called wage compression and particularly the impact <coughs> on uh, workers who are in jobs funded by Medicaid. And I know that's been an issue that's been a concern to people in this body and in the House, uh, looking at the issue of what we call direct service workers who, who get paid through the, through the Medicaid system and right now are earning very low wages. So in Vermont, uh, there's an amendment that's been attached that would also bump up the wages uh, for those who's whose income comes through the Medicaid system. And with that amendment, the bill has been referred, I believe, to a second committee. And then because there's an amendment, it'll obviously have to go back to the Senate before it's approved. But I just wanted you just to let you know that uh, across the river in Vermont, they're working on raising the wage higher. Uh, based on the research that Kathy Staub made reference to and Representative Moffitt made reference to, uh, I, I don't think we should expect that that's going to lead to somehow of the collapse of the Vermont economy, but, but that rather that lower people at the lower end of the wage scale will have an easier time affording their housing and will have more disposable income perhaps to be able to afford to spend money at local stores uh, buying things that they need. And that's all I have to, to Thank say you. today. Any questions? Thanks for your time. Thank you. Margaret Cho, support and speaking. Uh, chairman, uh, members of the committee, 
Um, my name is Martin. I'm an intern at AFSC, and I'm here today in support of H HB 186. I'm here today in support of increasing the minimum wage to a livable wage. Um, I remember when my family moved here to Concord from Ivory Coast, uh, my mother, my sister and I, we came, um, as soon as my mother came, she started working. Uh, she enjoyed her work and she was a hard worker. Um, I had never seen my mom taking a day off of work. Um, she was a great example for me and my sister and I. But what I did notice was she was having a hard time uh, making ends meet. Um, at some point, uh, the church that we were attending uh, stepped in and started assisting us with the rent. Uh, after some years had gone by, I also um, started working but the money that I was making uh, wasn't enough to like, get me through the week after um, helping out with uh, the costs of living at home. Uh, so I just, again, I just want you guys to consider young people like myself um, who have to work, uh, have school, um, and have so many obligations that we have uh, to juggle with. Um, I believe that people are, are working full time and uh, still have to worry about the cost of living and keeping a roof over their heads. Um, that is an evil and it's a moral crisis um, uh, that needs to be uh, taken care of. Uh, I have a code. Um, um, still, here, here we are like, uh, like almost two decades later since we moved from Ivory Coast um, to Concord, New Hampshire. Um, I'm, uh, and we're still facing the same thing, where now it's my, my friends that uh, were so excited about going to uh, college and getting their degree are uh, working very low-end jobs. Um, if you look at line number seven, is around uh, where some of them are, 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 um, are at as far as the income that they're making. I'm asking you today again um, to take action in increasing the minimum wage. And uh, uh, my student loan is following me, my um, car loan is following me, uh, but my check is running away. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one. You were an intern for AFSC? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is a paid internship? Like yeah, this is a paid internship. That's great. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was good. Thank you. And it's above the minimum wage. That's good. <laughs> I, I work for a labor union, and when I was saying we should have some interns in non paid, I said, You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Henry Bayou, propose and speak. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Henry Bayou, and I'm here on behalf of uh, two clients. Um, the first is the New Hampshire Lodging and Restaurant Association, um, and they oppose House Bill 186, uh, but prefer uh, the version that was passed by the Senate, Senate Bill 10. Uh, it had a very innovative approach to the tip wage, uh, and they were very supportive of that. Um, also here on behalf of the Granite State Home Health uh, Association, um, while they're not opposed to an increase, a gradual increase in the minimum wage, um, they would just ask the Senate and particularly the Senate Finance Committee uh, to consider a uh, rate increase. Um, as you probably know, many of the home health care providers accept Medicaid and Medicare, uh, and uh, those rates uh, are not keeping uh, pace but the cost of uh, doing that business. And so as the wage increases, uh, they would ask that um, the rates, uh, Medicaid rates also increase. Um, there are a number of them that have had to stop uh, doing uh, CFI in uh, Medicaid uh, um, patients uh, because they just can't afford it uh, and they go to the private pay. Um, so it, it does have an impact. Um, so we would just ask that uh, the Finance Committee also consider um, the reimbursement rate 
Um, and there are actually uh, several states, including the New Mexico and New York, uh, that have actually required Medicaid rate increases that are linked to schedule changes in their uh, state's minimum wage. So um, there are other states that have recognized that too. So with that, I would end my testimony. I've got from the home health folks. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. Everyone I have signed up. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to House Bill Thank you. 186? Yes. Please come up. Uh, I didn't sign in, but my name is Heather Stockwell. Uh, I work for Rights and Democracy as an organizer. Um, and I'm testifying today in support of this bill. Um, I have testified in the House as well. Um, one of the reasons that I'm testifying is that I have lived in the state for 50 years now. And I believe that my personal story illustrates many of the problems with not having a minimum wage. Um, and I am now reflecting back on the last uh, 30 of those years, approximately the over 30 that I've been working. And my son is about to turn 18 and enter the workforce himself and try to go to college. And that's a big reason that I'm here today is that I um, personally <clears throat> uh, am feeling the need to move out of the state, a state which I love dearly. Um, because I don't feel like the state supports the people in it and the families that are working. Um, when my son was uh, very young, I, uh, I, I literally quit a job because it paid me $7.25 an hour. I was traveling, uh, first of all, to take my son to daycare. And then I was traveling the same distance to get to my job and then back at the end of the day to daycare and then back home finally at the end of the day when I had not spent the majority of my time with my son, which is why I ultimately quit that job because my entire paycheck was going to that care. My husband's paycheck went towards maintaining the family budget. My pay did not even touch our food budget at that time at those rates. One of the ways that I have coped over the years uh, is to become an entrepreneur myself. So I have seen both sides of this issue from being an employer and working as an uh, um, independent contractor for 20 years in the construction industry. I was able to set my own rate of pay knowing that I was going to have to pay higher taxes on that, that rate, on, on, that, uh, wait, on those wages. Uh, I also found myself trying to um, also hire independent contractors so that I wouldn't be responsible for paying their health insurance on top of their wages. So as you can see, th this problem is systemic and it is affecting not only families at the grassroots level, but it's also affecting commerce and industry. And, and while I sympathize with some industry that will um, be affected maybe negatively by this. I think that it's, it's our job as a community and as government to fix it, to make sure that it's serving the people and not just the, the businesses and the corporations. The people have to have money in order to support the system. So um, I'm happy to take any questions about details about rates that I have made in, in certain areas of my life. But when I was 18, I found a job that paid $18 an hour. It didn't give me 40 hours a week. So the idea that these jobs pay a greater rate is terrific, but they're not also offering a full 40 hour week. So um, I, I think it's a misnomer to say that, that uh, rates are $25 an hour when, when that person might not actually be employed 40 hours a week. That's a great wage, but um, I think, I think th those, are, um, those are things to consider when we're looking at this, at this issue. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak to House Bill 186? Seeing none, I'd like to close the public hearing on House Bill 186. We do have some members that have to leave.